Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back convention co-chairs Marsha Gabrielov Layden and Roselle Unger. Good morning, everyone. We're delighted to see so many he people here this morning. We have a couple of quick announcements, and then we have a very special guest speaker that's not on the program that I think each and every one of you will be very interested in hearing what she has to say. Number one, I have some reading glasses up here. I don't know whose glasses they are, there are, but I'm sure as you're trying to look up, you can't see. So please, 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 if you do not retrieve them, they'll be, in the next few minutes, they're gonna be at the help information desk. Also, is, and I do not have your last name, I apologize, is Leanne in the room? Where are you, Leanne? Wave. I hear a yes. Okay, Leanne. Sarah Alpern is looking for you. Sarah is, is right back there waving. She has your book that you got signed from Daniel Silva. So please see Sarah. She doesn't want to bring your book home. If you don't go see her, she's going to bring it to the help information desk. Couple of quick announcements about lunchtime. Lunchtime will be the same process we did yesterday. You when we when the session, this next session is concluded, you will go outside, you will turn in your ticket, you'll pick up your lunch. There is plenty of seating in the rooms where the innovative learning sessions will take place. If you're planning on attending an innovative learning session, please pick up your lunch and go directly up there. We planned it so there would be seating for everyone. I know we were scrambling for seats. Also, I want to remind you, you cannot bring lunch back into this room and eat it. The room gets closed, it gets secured, and then the tech company, the production company needs to work in here starting at 12 noon. So, that being said, I hope you've enjoyed this morning so far. We have a spectacular session coming up. So, please take your seats, and at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Marsha. Good morning again, everyone. We have a very special guest, Carolyn Ben-Natan. She will be presenting at lunch this afternoon, but Carolyn is going to give us a brief update on the situation in Israel. She is the Director of Public Affairs for the Consulate General in, of Israel in LA. So please welcome Carolyn to uh, the podium. Good morning, everybody. I have my phone here. How many of you are signed into a either Red Alert or Tseva Adom on your iPhones? Okay, so then you know that in the last 20 minutes we've had 10 rockets that have been shot at Ashkelon, Nativot, and the Negev region. The cabinet is meeting to discuss extending this operation. At the same time, negotiations are continuing with Secretary of State John Kerry. But Israel's goals in this operation, of which we were forced to take to defend our citizens, remain the same. Security and quiet for the citizens of Israel. Destroying the terror tunnels and demilitarizing Gaza. Those terror tunnels are literally concrete threats to Israel. I am talking about 500 tons of concrete for one tunnel, a mile and a half long, wide enough to drive a car through. We are finding food to last for months in these tunnels. We're finding IDF uniforms in these tunnels. We are finding handcuffs, tranquilizers, and of course, weapons. With these tunnels, swarms of terrorist squads could come up in the front yard of an Israeli home and take over an entire neighborhood. They will not be tolerated. We want to thank Mayor Bloomberg for his visit, and we want to thank, that does deserve. And we want to thank Ma former Mayor Viragosa for his statement. If you haven't read his statement, I would highly suggest you Google his statement about the flight ban. 
Our airport is secure, our airport is safe, and we hope this ban is lifted soon. We are asking everyone, and everyone here, please join us. We need your voices. Multiply our voice, especially on social media. Who here is on Facebook? How many of you are liking the IDF page? How many of you are liking your local consulate page? How many of you are liking Ambassador Dermer's page? Please go to those pages, and not only to inform yourself, but you need to share the information. You need to make sure the truth is getting heard. We are asking you for that help. I can also suggest, please, I would suggest um, getting on a site called MIVZAKON, M-I-V-Z-A-K-O-N dot C-O dot I-L. That's not government suggestion, that's my personal suggestion, and it gives a, it'll translate it into English, and it just gives almost a minute to minute line as to what is happening throughout the country. It doesn't give an alarm or a buzz like a lot of these do, but it just gives you a line by line and you can check in every couple hours and you'll know what is happening. Also, don't forget Twitter. Uh, M-I-V-Z-A-K-O-N dot C-O dot I-L. You may not be able to get it here in the hotel. I'm not able to get it. It may be a connection problem. So. Okay, one more time. M like in mother, I, V like in Victor, Z like in zebra, A, K like in kite, O, N like in Nancy, dot C O, which is country, dot I L, which is Israel. Like I said, you may not be able to get it here while you're in the hotel, but I definitely get it in Los Angeles, and it's a nice, quick source of information. Because as I was saying, we're in this together. Yesterday, 30,000 people were at the funeral of Max Steinberg, a lone soldier from Los Angeles. 20,000 people were at Sean Carmelli's funeral the day before. Even though they are called lone soldiers, they are not alone. They are all our brothers, they are all our sons, and I know that no one knows that better and feels it than the women sitting in this room today. Thank you, Hadassah. Thank you for everything that you do. And I hope I'll see some of you later on today. Ladies and gentlemen, National Vice President and Development Co-Chair, Frida Rosenberg. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick announcement Roselle has asked me to make. Somebody lost a binder with a tablet in it, so if you should find it, please um, hand it in. We have it? Okay, so if you find it, um, if you just hand it in to Roselle. Okay, thank you. In a world where there is so much to be done, I felt strongly impressed that there must be something for me to do. Those were the words of Dorothea Dix in Antebellum America, the words of a nurse, an American activist, a reformer, and a philanthropist. Good morning. I am Frida Rosenberg, National Vice President and Vice Coordinator of the Development Division. It is my pleasure to welcome you this morning to what I know will be an outstanding session, the philanthropic power of women. Our panel of extraordinary women will motivate and inspire you as they explore cutting-edge ideas in today's world of philanthropy. Discover how they are meeting the challenges of the current economic environment in new and creative ways. Each of these remarkable women, just like Ms. Dix, also felt strongly impressed that there was something for them to do. Listen and learn with me about what inspired them to act as they have today in today's world of philanthropy. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists as I ask them to come forward to the stage. Suzanne Jaffe, philanthropist, president of SDJ Associates, a pension fund 
consulting business, and a member of the Hadassah Investment Committee. Marsha Rickless, philanthropist and leader in next generation fundraising. And Jackie Bailey, Hadassah Guardian donor and member of our national board. I would like to thank Janice Weinman, CEO and Executive Director of Hadassah, for bringing these wonderful panelists and this discussion to us today. And Janice will serve as our moderator on today's panel. Okay, let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Please read the bios of these wonderful women if you have a chance. In the program, um, we are not going through their extensive backgrounds, but you will really be impressed by what they have done. So we're going to start this morning with uh, Susie. You have done some research on the power of philanthropy of um, women. And I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of the trends and the new patterns of giving among women. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I actually have a cheat sheet because I thought if I didn't get the information right, I, I, you, you might write it down and I'd be embarrassed. So um, in the last few years, there have been many research institutions at, at prominent universities as well as on Wall Street who've been doing research on women's philanthropy and the power of women's philanthropy. What they've discovered is that there is a definite gender difference between how women give and how men give and their patterns. So I'm just going to give you a couple of thoughts. These are all um, myths, so let me give them to you. Women are viewed as less philanthropic than men. Women defer to their husband and household charitable decision making. Women do not make big, big gifts. All of these are myths, according to the research. Let me give you some facts. In the majority of households, women are either the sole decision maker or at least an equal partner. And in, when there's only one spouse, it's almost always the women who make these decisions. Baby boomers, and I'm going to assume I am one, and I'm going to assume a number of you are as well. There's 76 million of us, including 43 million women who are the largest generation in America today. And boomers and older women give more to charity than men. On average, a man gives $100 and a woman gives $190. And in the top 25% of donors, if a man gives $100, women give $260. That's a huge difference if you multiply it. So I thought you'd enjoy that. Um, also, women who participate in a philanthropic network are four times more likely to volunteer their time and money than women who don't participate in the network. So we all participate where we can. Um, and finally, education and income are the top two predictors to whether women will donate to charities. Thank you. That was great. That's a great beginning, and it gives us a context. So, Jackie, the other day you told me that you thought that women and men gave differently, um, that, there's a differ that there's a differentiation between women and men. So given Susie's statistics, give us a sense of what you mean by that. Um, well, I think that um, where, the, where I would go with this is that I don't think there should be a distinction between men and women. Um, I personally, um, I give uh, on my own. Um, I don't have to actually check with anybody, so I'm in a fortunate position. But I think that, um, I think women have as much responsibility and also as much freedom to give to charities as, as men do. And I think that they're, because of the evolution of so many more women in the workforce and so many more women who have their own independent incomes and uh, their own investments that I don't think there should be a gender differ differentiation between women and men giving to organizations. And yet, uh, Marsha, you established the Jewish Women's um, Philanthropy in New York. Foundation. Foundation. And tell us, did you do that because you thought women needed that particular um, opportunity or that uh, well, structure? Well, yes. Actually, um, I actually think that women do give very differently from men. And I think that that's because I think men give with their heads and women give with their hearts. And I think that women give to things that they care about and that is important to them. And, uh, and I, I think that's really actually a very important distinction between 
men and women. I, I spent two years as the campaign chair at UJA Federation of New York. I dealt with men, I dealt with women, and you know, women are the ones who are there, they're rolling up their sleeves, you can count on them, and, and they want to do something because they care about it. And I think that I just have to congratulate all of you for being here because obviously you are all women who care or you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have to point out Marlene Post. I'm sorry, she's one of your own, and she was a mentor to me when I first got started in philanthropy. So it's wonderful. I particularly would like to thank Marlene. Um, anyway, the Jewish Women's Foundation, what I found, I got involved through my business in something called the Campaign for Love Without Violence. And uh, in that process, I learned about domestic violence. I did it as a business. Thing and, and I learned about terrible things that were going on for women in this country. And I wanted to do something that would be related to women's issues. And I found that oftentimes the organizations that existed were not as uh, driven to take care of women in that way and specifically things that related to women. So I uh, helped to, it was not me, there were three wonderful women who established the Jewish Women's Foundation. I joined them very early on and helped to turn the Jewish Women's Foundation of New York into a wonderful, viable organization today that accomplished two things. It gave women a platform to run their own affairs, to do their own giving, and to determine who would get that money. And both of those things were really very important because I think it empowered women to understand that they have the ability to make those decisions, to run the organization like a business, and, uh, and yet do it with the compassion and caring and, and do the things that they cared about as women. That's great. That's very interesting. So Susie, having heard what <laughs> Marsha said, does um, the research support that Women's giving is an opportunity for them to express their own needs, to express the directions in which they Absolutely. want the, the funds to be going. What, is, what have you learned about that? Well, it won't come as any surprise to anybody that women um, have a desire to give back to the community. That's why they give. Um, they want to make a difference in people's lives. That's not a surprise to anybody in this room. They want to have impact. Um, they, um, they want a, a, an organization to communicate with them so that, that they understand what's happening and how they do. Um, the, the example that Marsha is using, um, the, this year at the New York Women's uh, Foundation lunch, they had one of the recipients who has this extraordinary um, program in, in Africa talk about what she was doing and how, and it just everybody in the room was, was really impressed because they got a sense to see where this money went and what kind of an impact it was having. It's very, very important, and it's particularly important to women. Um, I had a couple of other things. Um, this is not going to surprise anybody in here. Women live longer than men, on average about five and a half years. Um, there are many more, um, as, as Jackie said, uh, there are many more single women and women who've never been married, women who are divorced or widowed, um, and they have, they have a power that, that they are beginning to understand. Um, women in the workforce, as, as Jackie also mentioned, is really important. I mean, that there are more and more women who've been in the workforce and, and created their own wealth. Um, by 2030, 54% of American boomers will be women. And I just wanted to read you a couple of quotes that I found by women philanthropists, otherwise um, known, um, that I thought you would enjoy. One is by Maya Angelou. I have found that nothing among its other benefits, giving liberates the soul of the giver. And then there's Ann Landers, who I'm sure many of you know who she was. Do your giving while you're living, then you'll be knowing where it's going. <laughs> Which I thought was a good Ann Landers quote. And finally, Oprah Winfrey, who said, it's not just about being able to write a check, it's, a, it's being able to touch somebody's life. And um, I think that's something that the nurturing and the ability to touch somebody's life is something that women particularly feel um, in their gut, and it's another way that they're, they're giving is different from men. Um, interestingly, women tend to um, move around sometimes in who they give to and why they give because they want all those other things to come back to them. What's the impact I'm having? What, you know, what's been going on? 
uh, men tend to be very faithful to their organizations year after year after year after year. So um, it, it's, it's that gut feeling that I think is so important to all of us. So I think that gut feeling, Marcia, probably influenced you and your interests to not only express the power of women um, through philanthropy, but also to empower the next generation to be involved, to be responsible, to be accountable. So tell us a little bit about what you have done to really stimulate the next generation of giving, particularly through the Rickless Prize. Well, I would have to mention that my daughter-in-law is here in the audience. She participated in the Rickless Prize, so uh, that makes me very proud. I'm very proud to have her here with me. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get teary, sorry, uh, but it really, you have to go back and you have to start, I guess, with, um, you know, sort of me door la door, as you said this morning, Jackie, from generation to generation. And I would be remiss if I did not start with my mother and father. And uh, I spoke to my father this morning. He lives in Tel Aviv. So I uh, got a little uh, <laughs> update from him this morning. And I was taught by them and my mother was a Hadassah lady, <laughs> and so uh, this is not unfamiliar to me. And my mother is no longer alive, but I say that I think my mother would be very proud to know that I'm here today. So, <laughs> uh, you know, but it, it was really, we were, we were taught, my sister, my brother, and myself were taught that we were very lucky and that it was our obligation to move that luck forward and to give back to the community. And that was a really important value in my household and something that we all grew up with and that all of us believed in. And we each went our separate ways and we've done our own things over the years. But a few years ago, I, I had, um, you know, a, a combination, you know, a, a tsunami of events perhaps that brings you to a moment in time where you realize it's time to do something bigger and more important. I, I had always tried to get my own children involved in philanthropy, and I, I will mention something I mentioned to you this morning because I think that it's important because it shows how if you empower your children, they will accept it and be able to move forward. And I think that a few years back, I, I gave, I put aside a certain amount of money for my son and my daughter. They were each in their 20s. And I said, I'm putting this money aside for you to give away, and you will have to decide how you want to give it. But I'm making another pool in the center that you will have to give away together. And that will allow you each to say, okay, you know, I went to Dartmouth, I went to Brown, I want to give to my school, I want to give to something that's important to me but you will have to really think about the power of philanthropy and your power as a family when you decide what to do with that pool of money and you have to determine what your values are as siblings and how you want to move that money forward. And what was really exciting was that at the end of the year, they came and they told me that not only had they, they had given each the monies that they were giving separately, but they had then determined that they would each help each other. And so they spoke to each other about, well, what are you doing and what are you doing that I can also contribute to? So that, in and of itself, already created a family feeling that I thought was something really important and exciting. And they also said to me, you know, next year, Mom, when you do this, we'd like you to put more money into the pot that we do together rather than the separate pots. And I thought, again, that indicated to me something really exciting about our young people and what happens when we empower them and give them the opportunity to work together. So given armed with that, and then I had, uh, and as campaign chair at UJA Federation, I ran um, a conference uh, on social enterprise. And as campaign chair, and we had 200 of our agency execs at the conference, and I, I got an idea as a fundraising idea. I thought, well, here's an opportunity to create a prize. And I spoke to a few of our major donors at UJA, and they said to me, well, I'm doing other things, or it doesn't interest me. And then I thought, well, who better than my own family? Uh, everybody is an entrepreneur in my family. Uh, my father was a well-known entrepreneur. And it was sort of like, well, a social enterprise prize. What, you know, Who better to do it than us? 
And that coincided with something very personal, which I shared this morning, which is that my sister had just passed away. And I was deeply concerned about her children and how, and, and making sure that they felt embraced by the family and not uh, left out now that their, their mom was not there. And so I decided, I spoke with them, I spoke with my brother, and we decided to create something, we call it the Rickless Prize in Social Enterprise. And what we did was, it was the six cousins really ran this prize. We, my brother and I, removed ourselves entirely from the process, even uh, telling them not to put us on emails and just that they were in charge of it. But I did learn a few things in the process, and I think one of them is that when you empower the next generation to do something, you do have to give some very specific parameters, and it is very, very helpful if there is a facilitator who is not a member of the family. Yeah. So our parameter was that it would be a, so a prize in social enterprise and that it would go to one of our UJA Federation agencies. And it was staffed by somebody at UJA Federation who was the person it, who brought together the family, who set up the phone calls. And this is not an easy thing to do. There's, there's six grown kids, they're not kids, living in various parts of the country and putting them together and getting them all to talk and create criteria and read the proposals and, uh, and, and then ultimately to go out and see the agencies and see the things that they were doing. And it was really a remarkable thing. And one of the exciting moments was after they had their first family phone call, my niece, my sister's daughter, who lives in Boulder, Colorado, called me and said, you know, when we started this, I wasn't sure what it was. And now we had our first phone call, and I understand now that I'm going to learn a little bit about philanthropy, I'm going to learn a little bit about business, and every month I'm going to speak to my cousins on the phone. And it was really a, a moving and exciting moment. And the Friday before Passover, uh, my daughter-in-law was there. The kids all got together. They had a van. They visited agencies. They went. They sang songs. They really participated in this. And then about a month ago, they flew to New York and in order to, to give the prize out uh, in front of 200 people. And it was they. We're so excited, they can't wait to do it again next year, and they really felt involved in what they were doing. That is really beautiful. <laughs> and um, what you have done is, is very special indeed, and it speaks to the concerns that so many of us have about really bringing the next generation into the process. I know, Jackie, that you too have nurtured and encouraged your children through your family foundation to be part of the giving process. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that as well. Um, well, we were very fortunate. Uh, we, um, we owned the Seattle IKEA, and when we sold it, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to start a family foundation with the four members of the family um, as equal partners. And the, as, as you suggested, the first thing we did was have somebody who handles family foundations to be the organizer of the annual general meeting. And that first general meeting, it was like, okay, like, uh, you know, let's, how, how fast can this be over? And, and over the six or seven years that we've had the foundation, it has been, um, it has been very interesting to see the kids become much more involved in the process, in giving their ideas of who they would like to have grant applications from, and um, to be part of to be part of the discussion. And and actually, at the last meeting, it was basically it was my son who said, "Okay, well, let's move on. Which is the next one?" And he was kind of moving the process along as as the meeting you know, as the meeting progressed. But I think, you know, also, um, I also agree, you know, one of my core values is uh, Midor Lador, passing on to the next generation. Because as much as we'd like to live here forever, we won't. 
And they're the ones who are going to be carrying on. And only for me, by, um, by demonstrating what my, um, what my passions are and, what, and, and living what I believe in, can I pass on to the next generation, um, I guess, those feelings of, of paying it forward, of being responsible for the rest of the world. And um, you never really know with your kids how much they're listening and how much they really pick up until they do something. And it can be as simple as you know, wanting to do a site visit to uh, an organization that is retraining people for, you know, that have been in jail or that have been on drugs and that are now clean. And um, to be, you know, to listen to them, ask the questions and to understand those processes. Um, I, I, I had the opportunity, and I'm not sure how much this is on that, um, on that vein, but I had the opportunity to visit the Jewish Family Services in Seattle, and it was... Uh, it was a site visit for us. Our foundation does support them. They've just built a new building, so I had a lovely tour. And then I was sitting in the office of the CEO, and I looked at his wall, and it was like an opaque wall with writing all over it. And at one part of the wall, there was a design, a diagram. It kind of reminded me of the Da Vinci Code, but it was three lines like this. And so the one line like that, that is what are the world's greatest needs. And the line like that, what are your gifts and, 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 and your um, attributes? And the line in the middle was, what are your passions? And you draw a circle where they all intersect, and that is your happy place. So for me, in order to pass something on to the next generation, I try to live in my happy place. I try to follow my passions. And I think by doing that, um, that that transmits itself from everything you do when you're when you're talking to your kids and by you know who you are and what you say and what you do, and I just for me the the next generation is is going to learn by their own experiences, but also I have to live my own passions and for them to pick up you know, what my passions are, and to make them their own. That is a terrific, yeah. a terrific example of passing along. Yeah. I thank you. Can I, can I sure, add Marcia, some of that? that because, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, because it actually brings me back to somebody asked a question in the previous um, session about when you see somebody on the street and they ask for money and what to do, and then that reminded me of, of something which is that my, my son always had the need to give everybody on the street money. And we were, we were walking in the street one day with my brother. He was 11 years old, my son, and he said, and he saw somebody and he wanted to give him money. And my brother said to him, you know, David, there's a better way of doing this. I will come and pick you up at 5 o'clock in the morning on Friday morning, and you come with me to a soup kitchen where you can work yeah. and give and, and feed the homeless. And my son for three years went every Friday morning with my brother at wow. five o'clock in the morning to go to a soup kitchen and feed the homeless. And, you know, and I think that when you talk about you know, living your example and also having family that supports you in, in, in all of that, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's really a wonderful thing. So I, you know, living in that sweet spot, and I think that the children learning from what you do and from seeing it around them is really, really important. I think that that's certainly um, one of the lessons we can take from here, that regardless of what level you're giving, to be able to be involved in the hands-on process of philanthropy is really an incredibly important part of learning about um, why it's so important to give back. You know, the two of you have family foundations, and not all women have the opportunity to either be able to or can participate in foundations the way you have created. So I know that some women are moving into the trend of um, giving circles. 
Um, and that has become a new phenomenon in women's giving. And I wonder, Susie, if you, by virtue of what you have examined and explored, if you could describe that to us a little bit, because it's another model of the power of women in philanthropy. Happy to do so. I, I'm just listening to these, the passion that both of these women <laughs> feel about what their philanthropy does and how they pass it along to the next generation. And I just want to applaud you. I think it's fabulous, 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 fabulous. Um, as as uh, um, you, you probably know what women's foundations are, because I think most communities around the country have a women's foundation, or many of them do. But giving circles are sort of a somewhat new phenomenon. And essentially what they are is they're a group of women, not always, but mostly they're a group of women who collectively come together and understand that they can do more and have more impact and be more focused and strategic if they do it together. Mm -hmm. And so um, cool. they can be very large organizations like women, it's a, something like m m women's million to million. It's, it's a woman who was a Goldman Sachs partner who's now running it and, and she, um, uh, she's got so far 200 women who've pledged a million dollars each to this organization which is to help women and girls. And it's usually the giving circles are very focused. It's something that you know, the group wants to be involved with. And so in, um, in, in the grassroots way, um, you don't have to give a million dollars. A lot of times in local communities, there'll be um, people who want to look at after school programs or cultural programs or anything for underprivileged kids in their community. They all agree on what they want to give, give for. They work out a plan, and then they decide what the giving pledge should be. It could be $200 from a whole group of people in a relatively small community, and then they are, they are very good at figuring out how to make that happen. So it could be a, they start a program in one school in their community, and they realize that all the other schools need it as well. So they will raise more money, or they get more people involved and engaged. And what, what the women do is they give money, they give time, and they give skills, because they all have different sets of skills and, 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 have, and amount of time that they have. Um, so it's a real phenomenon. It's grown to be, uh, all, it's just everywhere in the country, and it started with women. Um, and I think it's feel, pe women feel very empowered when they can do things like this at, at the level that they, they feel that they can do it. In a way, we do that too, by virtue of our chapters and the kind of work that our individual chapters and regions do in their communities. Um, it is a different way of, of handling the process, but it's outside of of this particular model, but it is another, it certainly represents the kind of feeling and, and joint activity that we, we feel and we express at Hadassah, and we actually put in, in implement. But you know, Susie, I, we're mainly baby bloomers in this room, and um, there are certain patterns that I know exist among baby bloomers, particularly among women baby bloomers, and, um, could you just tell people what <laughs> kinds of patterns there are, what kinds of trends there are, what kinds of behaviors there are among the baby boomers? Well, most baby boomers know this. We've already changed the world in, um, in all the decades that we've been around. We've changed social, political, economic patterns, cultural activities, um, broadened a whole t bunch of topics that were off the table for many, many, many years. And what women have discovered is they can do the same thing now with philanthropy. And it's no different. I mean, it's really no different. It's, it's they've seen the impact. Of the, I keep using the same words, but that's honestly, that's what it's all about. Um, they, they, they've done it in all these other areas. Why can't they do it in philanthropy, they say? Well, they can, and they are. Um, it's, uh, the giving circles is one example, but um, you know, women tend to be more nurturing than men. And um, so we, we, when, we want, when we sink our teeth into something, we want to really understand it. We want to know what the pro programs are. We want to know what we're giving to. We want to feel it. And um, it, it's, again, I think it's the nature of the baby boomers, because we have done it before. And we've done it in so many different arenas. Why not in, in what we're doing here? Um, I sometimes wonder why, why men don't want to sink their teeth in things as much as women. I mean, again, baby boomer women tend to want to be a part of something. They want to participate together in, in, in all sorts of ways. Um, politically, they've done it, you know? And, and, and so, it, again, it, why shouldn't you be able to do it in your philanthropy and in the things that you like to do? Well, the, the statistics bear this out. And as I said earlier, by, I think it's 2030, 
55% of, of uh, boomers will be women. Um, they got a lot to do, and they have a lot of things that they want to do, and so um, keep doing it. <laughs> it's, Jackie, you want to add something to that? I, I think well, you want to frame it a diff another way. So as, as much as, as things change, the, that's as much as they stay the same, and there are certain basic, um, basic female human values, things that, that uh, I, I connect with, with Henrietta Zold, and a uh, hundred years ago, for me, Henrietta Zold saw a need and filled it. And for me, that's been kind of one of the core values in my work with Hadassah, is to see a need and to fill it. And um, I think that there is a certain basic human nature, a basic female human nature, that men are more hierarchical and who, where you stand on the ladder is very important, whereas women are much more um, collaborative. It's much more of a symbiotic relationship so that we figure out how can we work together. I swear, if women ran all the governments, there would no, be no wars, let me tell you. <laughs> And the last thing we want to do is send our sons and daughters into battle. So, because nothing good ever comes of that. But, um, but I think that there are, you know, certain basic human natures that, that uh, as you say, with philanthropy, we can step into that the way we've stepped into the job world and into the politics and into many other areas. And um, I think that as women, we hold a lot more power than we give ourselves credit for. And um, um, one of the reasons, I mean, one of the things that I'm passionate about is, you know, comes from my own personal experiences. Um, I, you know, my, my, son, uh, my son had leukemia, my brother had a ruptured brain aneurysm, and my, and my husband had a, a stroke all in like six, six month period so you know when I get up in the morning I can breathe I can put my feet on the floor it's always a good day and um, I think that's kind of the experience that has guided myself and our whole family to um, to appreciate what we have and to be grateful I think that one of the other panels that was up here I think it was Brett Stevens yesterday who said you know, when he went to Texas and he could sit in an air-conditioned movie theater and then go sneak into a second, uh, uh, you know, a, a second movie, it was a, you know, it was a treat. And I think that, uh, I think as women, that we do get our feet dirty, we get our hands dirty, rather. Well, my feet dirty, too. But um, we, we do, we step in and we are contributors. We're not just donors with money, but we are contributors. We give of our time. We get involved, um, and I think that um, at whatever level, you mentioned this, at whatever level that fits for you, that we give of our, we give of our funds. And uh, I know that I am very fortunate. I have a business manager, and she always seems to look over all the bills and find money, and I always try to find a way to give it away, and I make her crazy. <laughs> But, you know, it's true. I, I think that the more that we can do to help other, other women, but women and children, because we really do run the world, um, that I think the more that we can do to help them, I think the better our world will be for our children and our grandchildren. So, Marsha, you, um, you really embody the power of women in philanthropy. You have you addressed many, many, yes, she, she's being modest. You have um, <laughs> addressed many needs um, in many different ways. And I wonder, for everybody in this room, what is it that drives you? What is it, what need do you see required to be fulfilled? What parts of you make you address one need versus another? And tell us also not only about that, but the way in which you've broken down silos in giving through in organizations that you have actually, you know, really put on the face. Okay, well that that's a very <laughs> difficult question. So let me try Take to break down that question uh, a, a little bit. 
you know, I think one of the things I think, you know, as I look out there and, and, you know, I worked in business and I worked with men and I actually work with a lot of men at UJA Federation and I have great respect for men as well as for women, <laughs> but I do think that women are multitaskers and I think that uh, that translates in philanthropy to actually being able to do many things and being involved in many different kinds of philanthropy. You said earlier that men tend to stick to the one thing and in philanthropy, you know, whereas women can have many, many interests. And when I first got more deeply engaged in philanthropy, you know, Federation was a natural. My father had been the, the you know, his name is still on the stationery, so it sort of seemed like a natural place for as a lifetime trustee or something. So that was a natural place for me to go. But, but I also, uh, you know, I, I began to develop over time what were my passions because, you know, as we spoke about this morning, you can, you know, you can be very, um, you know, everybody wants a piece of something, you know, of money, of time, of brain power. And at some point you realize that, you know, there's still only so much to go around and how are you gonna divide that up? And so, you know, I think for me, as I said, there were a few things. I think that I really, I think when I got deeply engaged at UJA Federation, I think they thought that I would be the sort of Israel piece, being that my background and my family background is Israel. But the reality is, is I, I personally really came at it more from the social service end. I think that I just really care passionately, you know, there's probably a reason my son wanted to give a dollar to every person on the street that he saw that was homeless. Uh, by the way, I have to say something because there was a question asked at the earlier session. Another thing my brother taught me was, or taught my son, was don't give a dollar give uh, you know, a, a McDonald's gift certificate or give yeah. something that can actually, you, you, you know, carry that in your pocket rather than that dollar. So I just wanna make that suggestion that I think that that is a, is a very, uh, a, almost a better way than to just give a dollar. But you know, I, I think the social service and caring about people in need, we all know that in philanthropy you can give to the arts and you can give to, and that may be somewhat more prestigious uh, but that wasn't what motivated me. I really felt that for me, it was seeing people in need and understanding that I had the power to help them. That was something I felt very strongly about. At the same time, of course, my Israeli background makes me also feel very strongly about Israel. And so on the one hand, it was sort of people in need, then there is women's issues which continue to be important to me, and then there is Israel. And I try to attack Israel from many different points of view. Certainly, you know, the issues relating to peace in the Middle East uh, haven't succeeded so far. But, <laughs> but um, you know, being engaged and involved in that. And I also recently sponsored the writing of a textbook that it's for college and it's co-written co by an Israeli a Palestinian and an Egyptian. And what it is meant to do is to show that you can take the same set of facts and every person can have their own narrative around that set of facts. And so the textbook divides up the history of the conflict and then gives the Israeli narrative around those facts, the Palestinian narrative around those facts, and the, um, and the regional narrative around those facts. And I, we talk about the power of philanthropy, but what the power of philanthropy can do for you personally, for I found for me personally, sitting in on those sessions, being able to see what, you know, how they had to negotiate between them to write this textbook was for me a moving and enlightening experience about how people can find ways of finding a truth within what could be many truths. And so, you know, I think there was a great power for me in being engaged in that. I'll just add one thing because some of that is, you know, I, I think, again, I started by saying women are multitaskers. I think on the one hand, there are the small organizations on the ground where you're doing things. And I think it's important to do that because it gives you a real sense of, of accomplishment when you can do that. But I also think it's important to be involved in big organizations like a Hadassah, like a UJA Federation, 
because I think those large organizations, they're the ones that are able to be there when, when, when the times are bad, they, they, can, they can garner the power of the, of the larger groups and make more happen. And so I think that it's important for women to, be, to do both, because we are multitaskers, and to also be there in order to help those larger organizations do a better job, have better governance, be more compassionate. I think that, you know, that, that if it's at all possible, it's important to try as women to do both. And I'll add one last thing about the next generation on this, because the baby boomers and our talents and what we've managed to accomplish is great, but we know that the world is changing. And so when we try to help our next generation get involved in philanthropy, we also have to understand what they bring to the table, which is a knowledge of this new and modern world and technology that I know I don't have. <laughs> and so I think if we respect our, our, our children. I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and understand that they really do bring something important to the table as well. I think that it will help them to want to move forward in this field. Absolutely, now Susie. You sit on the boards of many. Oh, I was just going to follow up with that. I I'm going to let you. Oh, <laughs> go, go ahead, though. Sorry. I, I, I was trying to set something. you up. I was, I was just going to say, um, you know, I come from Washington, D.C., and nobody's ever heard of my father, I quite assure you. Um, and um, he was a wonderful human being. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I, got an, I know Marsha from the UJ Federation of New York, and I got involved because um, I was interested in the social service side, just exactly what she said. By the way, many women are interested in things like that as opposed to uh, more cut and dry kind of stuff. I mean, social services is sort of where it's at. Um, and I got involved, and um, what I discovered is we were giving a lot of money to organizations in Israel. So I started going to Israel, and I went two or three times a year. I had never been before. And um, it was spectacular, and I learned to both appreciate and, and empathize um, with this extraordinary democracy in the in a, not a good neighborhood. Um, and, uh, and the more I got involved, the more I realized that I cared. And, um, and then I got involved with the, our domestic agencies in New York. We have about 100 uh, individual organizations that are part of our network. Um, and the more and more you see of it, and the more a a incredible activities you appreciate, um, I give much more money than I used to to New York <laughs> Federation because I just, it just, I got caught up with it. So I'm a good example of, you know, when I'm saying you can start small, you can right. you get your hands into it, you get involved. I learned about Israel, I have this great love and passion for Israel now, and, um, and I love our domestic agency, so I just wanted to That's add that. It's very important. Jackie, I think you want to add something as well. Well, I, I think the part that both of you have brought up is the education that you get along the way. and and. I, th I think, you know, somebody asks you for money, you write them a check or you give them some money and, you know, you kind of go on your merry way. But I think that when you uh, start to learn a little bit more about um, what these people are doing and, and to meet the, meet the people, um, you, I, I think this is something that we can again pass along to our, to our uh, next generation, is the more you learn, the more you become involved with them. And I've had the privilege of being involved with Israeli soldiers who've been injured in battle, serious. Uh, they've been in the most, you know, the paratroopers and the SEALs, and, and they come to Seattle once a year, and they spend a week, and they do, they, there's home hospitality. And the first time I had them stay with me, which was about eight years ago, um, it was because I wanted my kids to be exposed to these guys, but it was me who got <laughs> who got the exposure, and it was me who got, uh, who got the, the education. And I, um, I now have done this for eight or nine years, and I have sons all over Israel, um, and I actually am called my second mama a lot. And um, you become so much, more, so much more connected to whatever it is that they're doing and how they are changing Israeli society. That and, you know, it's the, it's the education that you get about, about the organizations and also about our history. I, I firmly believe that there is like a 3,000-year-old DNA running around my system that um, I know we talk about 
always talking about never forget the exodus from Egypt, but I really do feel there are times where um, I, I'm one of those people who came out of Egypt and, um, and, and as women, we have to shed that slave mentality and realize that we are the leaders and we are the Miriams and, and um, you know, that we can take uh, the, the people into the next generation. And I, I firmly believe that there is definitely a role that education plays in moving us forward towards that. I, th I think that that is a perfect segue into questions. You have really summarized not only what drives the three of you um, towards philanthropy, but also the values that we all share in terms of giving, um, whether it's in Hadassah, UJA, um, or any other organization. So these are three remarkable women. They are women who are, you know, they, they do what they say. And their commitment has been constant over a long period of time. And we're very, very grateful to the three of you. I want to make sure that we have time for people to ask you about a little bit more about the, what you have said about you, about what you see as the future. So I'm going to open it up um, to the people in the audience for questions. We'll start with mic number one. My name is Carol Gendel. I'm with Adasa Southern California. And I have two fundraising portfolios with my area. I'm plan giving. And with the region, I have grassroots fundraising. So I'm developing quite a passion for that. What I see, having moved from the East Coast, is women who, um, there seems to be less of a culture of giving among women our age. And it is difficult to get women to be inspired, even in a fundraising organization, to step forward. How would you, what would you recommend in creating a message to reach out to people? I, I have ideas that I'm hoping to put into effect at home, but what do you recommend it to reach people who are perhaps not at the top level, who are in the grassroots fundraising area, to touch them, to say, you didn't just give back on the East Coast. You didn't give back where you came from. Every community needs your help. How do we help the, get those people to contribute? Who would you Marcia? Like? Well, I think, you know, what, what we do at UJA Federation is we really try to get people out into the field to see the work. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that it, you, you can't just talk about something. You, you really have to get out and, and view it and see it. I think that's number one. And I think that another thing is that, you know, in a fundraising organization, oftentimes donors feel very, um, very put off by the fact that they only get a phone call once a year to say, you know, would you give money? And, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, that, that, that sort of works with the men in the Wall Street division. Right. <laughs> but it really doesn't work with the women. It, it's sort of a little bit like a, really, do you not have an interest in what I have to say or what I think? Mm -hmm. and, and that makes me think about one of the things when we talk about what we get back from philanthropy by being givers is we get community. And so, you know, I think that really trying to, whether it's a giving circle or whether it's a, you know, we, we, we're over-evented sometimes, but it really can be, you know, not, it doesn't have to be a fancy event, but getting people together where they begin to learn and meet other, other people of like mind, that really is a very helpful way for people to, to begin to get involved. Thank you. Okay. Mike number two. Good morning, I'm Daphna Michelson from Denver, Colorado. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the generosity with which you contribute to our community. It is, um, and not only our specific community, but the, com the global community as well, so very grateful. Uh, what I'd like to say, and I'm really saying it to our membership here, is as powerful as this panel is, the important component that's missing is that some of us who are not quite at this economic level, although we are working towards it and we look forward to meeting you upon that level, that. Um, also have an incredible impact you want to, that? to give and to give powerfully. And we do it through this organization. And I just think that 
um, when, you, when you talk about the next generation, and again, I love, I can't even imagine the relationship your child has with your brother, and that's beautiful. That, that in itself is such a tremendous gift. But when you talk about ushering along the next generation and, and the way that you're gonna, doing it, I'll you are definitely modeling thing, yeah. how we wish to do it. But I don't want a phone call. I don't need a phone call. After I have given my money, I have given my money because I've selected, I've looked at the organization, I have a, a limited amount to give, and I make my choice very specifically. And once I've given it, I don't want to waste staff resources on it. I don't even want to waste volunteer resources on it. I want to get to work, like you said. Um, and, and you model that too. You're not just giving from a, a, up here. You're giving from within the depths. That's what each of us do. So understand when you're looking at these amazing, successful, incredible women, that we are all them as well. Thank you. I think that the beauty of Hadassah, as we mentioned before, is the opportunity, both in communities and at the national level, to participate at any level that is comfortable for you. And not only to do it by virtue of giving money, but by virtue of being part of the community that was just mentioned. So we thank you very, very much for that point. I know Jackie wanted to respond as well. Um, one of the, well, first of all, um, I'm very fortunate to be able to be sitting here, but it wasn't always like that. Uh, I, come from a, I come from a history of my mother putting money in the pushka. That might be the Canadian way of saying it. Or, but um, whenever there was uh, something good that happened or you wanted to have a mishubarach for somebody. And, and that's sort of where I came from. And uh, for many years, uh, you know, if I could give, I would give like $25. And that, you know, so you all start, you, you start at all levels and it's what's, what resonates with you, what, what makes you feel good. Um, and uh, I think that, that like over, over time that the cultivation is really important and I think you referred to this, Marsha, that, and, and the girl before, that you need to maintain contact and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, any kind of fancy gala or anything like that, but coffee with somebody and just keeping them up to date and exposing them, getting them to put faces and names and experiences with whom you are, you are contributing. That's and, important. And, you know, and I think also those volunteer opportunities are yes. really, really it's exceedingly it. important. I, I think that um, you know, I'm working now actually with groups of Israelis in New, in, in New York. There are many Israelis that live outside of, of, of Israel today. And they, they come from a culture that says, well, I give. I went to the army and I, you know, they're, they're not, uh, you know, giving money is not what they're used to doing. And so one of the things that we're working on is creating volunteer opportunities because that they relate to and that they understand. And as they get more involved in volunteer opportunities and being able to bring their young children uh, to pack up backpacks for poor children who don't get to go to school with a new backpack or, you know, or, or maybe now it's to help the war effort in Israel or whatever it may be, you know, that is a way of helping them to find their, their own um, level of comfort philanthropically. And I congratulate you because I think all all levels and all ways of giving are important. It makes, it's, it's, we make others feel good and we make ourselves feel good. That's correct. So we have limited time, so may I ask you to, number one, to make your questions brief, and number two, we will not take any more people to the mic. Um, yes. Okay. I'm Sharon Prisher, Hadassah, Southern California, and Daphne, Daphne, you are a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, I was, Marsha, you, you said something about giving your children a pool of money. We, uh, several years ago, we gave our children their Hanukkah gifts and part of cash, and part of the deal was they had to give a, a certain percentage of it to a, some charity. But as you said, you have to put parameters on it because 30-year-old children may, I have one who is in outer space and would love <laughs> to give her money to, you know, buy a star or something like that. So you have to be very, Specific, you have to put parameters on it. But we did not do what you mentioned, and I think everybody should listen to this, 
a, create a pool of money for them to choose together. And I think that is a brilliant idea. Um, when question? We, uh, hmm? Question, so please. The question is, how do you, how do you manage this, I guess? <laughs> uh, you brought somebody in from the outside, you said? Well, because I did it through UJA Federation of New York, we, we did have a staff member at UJA Federation. And I should tell you, the staff members at UJA Federation, they were all hoping to be the one chosen to do this, because it was pretty exciting for them as yeah. well to get to work with this group of six kids. But that was how we did it, because that we needed to facilitate getting out to see the projects and the agencies, gathering the, the, the RFPs in one place, and then getting the family together yeah. to do it. I, I it would have been really difficult if I had tried to yeah. do it myself. I think that is brilliant, but I do want to say that our kids have continued because we gave them that seed money the one year. So you can inspire them and just do it. And let's inspire right. them to give to Hadassah. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, number two. I know. Hi. Uh, I feel like everybody's almost said everything that I wanted to, but I wanted to bring up, um, I'm a fifth generation life member of Hadassah. Um, my mom passed away, uh, your site is coming up. I know she's here and proud as she can be that, that I'm uh, at a convention. I enjoyed immensely hearing uh, ladies speaking. And I wanted to give an example. Uh, I think it must start at home in a small way, whatever you're doing. And I live in a community, I'm sorry, my name is Debbie. I'm from South uh, Jersey, uh, New Jersey. Uh, it, it was uh, very important in my community that everybody have this uh, humongous bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, wedding stuff, where thousands and thousands of dollars were, I think, wasted. Your question, very, please. For a very early age, I uh, wanted my children to understand the importance of Hadassah and, and other charities. And at their bar and bat mitzvahs, they picked the charity. Yeah. Instead of flowers on the Mitzvah. table, they picked it. And I thought that was a one-shot deal. My daughters are married to Israelis. Um, both of them are in Golani. When they got married, oh God. the money went to Hadassah instead of to the flowers. So That's wonderful. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are running very late. And I'm going to ask whoever is at the mic, and we may even have to cut you off, please Ask your question, and then we'll be able to give other people an opportunity. That's Sarah. what I'm going to do. Sarah Aronson from Boston. My question is to the two women with the foundation. Do you have a committee that help you to make the philanthropic decision? And if you do, accept family members, do you put on other, other people, and how do you pick those other person outside of the family? Um, our family foundation, we have somebody who uh, facilitates it. He runs it. He organizes the, the meetings. But um, the decisions are made at, uh, we have an annual meeting. And um, the discussion is at the annual meeting. We, this year, um, it is a process. And this year, we're doing site visits um, before to be able to be more familiar with with what we're doing. Um, it is a growing process. It's a, it is a whole industry of preparing your heirs. And, and my question was the composition of the committee. The com the, our composition is just the four family members. And yours, Marsha? Marsha? Well, we actually don't have a foundation per se. I have a foundation. <laughs> so it is not yet. <laughs> Uh, formulated in such a way that, the, that, that I've brought the, the next generation into the foundation. And actually, these are issues that, that as we begin to determine, we're, we're struggling with. And one of the reasons I gave them money to, to give away a few years back and have tried to keep up with that was so that when we start to set up the governance of the foundation, that they would be able to actually help me to, to determine how we should do that. But I would imagine that the committees would be uh, just family members. I, I think that uh, you know there's a certain ownership there that is very important. And even when we set up the Rickless Prize, my nephew, because my, my sister had passed away, my nephew and niece were contributing to the prize, where uh, my children and my brother's children were, were actually not. And uh, it was suggested that there should be other, other people on the committee, and my nephew said, no, I want to do this with my cousins. 
So I think that um, what, you know, sometimes family businesses can be sources of, of, of tension in families, and a foundation is an opportunity for a family to work together to do something good, and taking advantage of that opportunity is, is Thank I you. Think, important. Uh, Marsha and Roselle have told me that we're so way over that we can only take one more question, so we'll do it from Mike too. I sincerely apologize to the rest of you. Um, this was so so expansive and so rich that we didn't have as much time for questions as we thought. Natalie, Natalie. Silverman, Springfield, Illinois. Quick question, seriously. The running thread through all of your discussions is the fact that it needs to be a hands-on experience. Hadassah, it's a little hard to hands-on. How do you, did you speak? how do you oh, engender a belief in a large organization that has an Israel-based component to it. Jackie, do you want to respond? Because you know Hadassah the best. Right. Um, OK, so the best way, and I've seen this in action, is um, if somebody is going to Israel, they're going to Israel anyways, that we can always arrange a tour of the hospital. And I've had people say to me, what is going on? Like, a hospital? Are you serious? And, um, and then they get to the hospital and they go, oh my God. And so that has, uh, that has brought in donors for us. That's the first thing. If they're not going to Israel though, then um, bringing Israel to your, to your community and to try to get um, as many times as, as you can, uh, you, you get a doctor who comes and tells the stories or you get a Barbara Sofer who comes and tells stories because you have to bring the experience of what is actually going on um, in, you know, at, at Hadassah. Thank you. Susie? I just wanted to add that, that um, Hadassah's been in the paper, in, in, the, in the news the last couple of, of weeks with all that they're doing in Ankarim, which is, which is fabulous. I've been to the unit there. It's, a, it's a extraordinary, the trauma center. So um, I think that just making sure that people hear and read and see what they do, particularly in times like this, is very important for the local communities. Thank you. And um, just to sum that question up, there's so much that we can do through our own activities, um, through Hadassah, that it gives people the hands-on that you know so well, Natalie, and that we, we really um, need to stress more and more. I would just like to thank the panel. I know Frida's going to do the same. I think this has been a remarkable opportunity. And um, from Susie to Marsha to our own Jackie, they really deserve a really big round of applause. And thank you so much. Thank you. Should we get up and leave? Yes. Thank you. We want to thank this exceptional panel and our moderator for their thoughtful and inspiring remarks today. Your message is important. You serve as role models for us all. And for these attributes which you shared with us today, we thank you.